Hello there, and welcome to another episode of The Inevitable. This is Motor Trends Podcast on the future of mobility, future of the car, where are we going, how are we going to get there, what's powering them, and this Ooh. one... My co-host, Johnny Lieberman, has been in my ear about this for a very long time, and I'm finally grudgingly <laughs> saying, all right, let's talk about synthetic fuels, That's which right. I will be honest, I thought was a bit of a scamboni ahead of- Greenwashing for the petroleum industry. Exactly. Let's just keep the keep that machine going by producing whatever, hydrocarbon fuel, whatever. Anyways. But look, here's the thing, Ed. Ed Lowe. Uh, the future is electric. We understand this. By 2050, there won't really be that many gasoline-powered vehicles to buy. Maybe a couple V12s. Maybe a Porsche GT3 will still have an internal combustion engine. However, those are the new cars. We'll still have like one and a half billion cars that uh, burn gasoline. So what if you could have a fuel that these cars recognize as gasoline or diesel that when you burn it in your engine, it does not release any new carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Right. It That's a lot to unpack. That's a lot right there. It essentially recycles it. Yeah, but yes. we talked to this guy. This guy. His we name talked is to this guy. Carl Dumbs. Carl he's Dumbs. He's really smart, despite the name. <laughs> and yes. he is, what's his title? He is Senior Project Lead E-Fuels at Porsche AG. So he's from the German mothership, and we talked to him at Rensport Reunion 7, hence the t-shirt. Uh, this was recorded after, I think, our previous episode when we did uh, the conversation with the Michelin and the Porsche guys. We managed to score some time with Carl Dumbs, the senior manager on eFuels, after Johnny got to do what, Johnny? Oh, yeah, that's true. <clears throat> this is pretty cool. So um, the first Ferrari is lost to history. The first Mercedes, gone. Uh, first Chevrolet, first Ford, they don't exist anymore. First Porsche, I drove it. Um, and it had a gas tank stuffed with e-fuel. And uh, again, it was, you know, it, what, was it any different? No. Uh, chemically, this stuff is gasoline. What was it like to drive? I don't know. This thing's essentially priceless. I wasn't going very fast, and I was just tripping out the whole time. Right. But um, it, it worked. And a lot of the cars at Rensport, actually all the cars that Porsche put on the track, were powered by gasoline that they made, their, their own e-fuel. Right. Um, so it's a, re it's a really important topic. I think this is one of the more important podcasts we're going to do. And um, a lot of people, when you say e they go, oh, synthetic fuels. I don't know if they understand what it is. I didn't understand I didn't what it is. It, to be honest. And now we know, and now you're about to know. Please enjoy this episode of The Inevitable. But yes, be skeptical, but listen closely. Thank you so much, Carl Dumbs, for joining us here uh, at Rennsport. Uh It's going to be fantastic to chat with you. You just said that you are a huge Porsche guy. How long have you been with the company? Uh, I'm working for Porsche since 2008, for 15 okay. years now. Okay. But as my father already worked for Porsche, Porsche was always part of the f kind of a uh, part of a family. Okay. What did your father do for Porsche? Uh, he was a mechanic and he worked at the production uh, site in Zuffenhausen. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. um, what yeah. did he What did he work on? Uh, what, what it was on? the mechanical uh, the mechanical manufacturing for crankcases okay. and and engine parts. Ah, oh wow! Okay. So down in the foundry almost. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> exactly. did you did you was your first car a Porsche? Did you <laughs> did you drive? Did you uh, take your my, driver's test in a Porsche? Uh, my my first car was a Volkswagen. Okay. <laughs> Good a deal. Scirocco. Okay. At least there's in, a relation in the group. It's now, but it's a uh, it's a uh, in, within the Volkswagen group. Yes. Now yes. we're really beating around the bush because you know <laughs> our show, the inevitable, the future of mobility, Ding. and we spend a ton of time talking about electric vehicles specifically. And anytime you say anything publicly about an EV, you have a hundred thousand people who say, "Whoa, e fuels, synthetic fuels." And so you're the guy at Porsche spearheading this this project. You got to tell us every single thing about e-fuels. And I'll start with, I drove yesterday the uh, 356 number one, the very first Porsche sold to a customer. Um, uh, it was a prototype, but you still sold it, and it had a tank full of e-fuel, and exactly. it felt like a regular car. <laughs> yeah. But with what, that are, mind, what are yeah. Yeah, what are e-fuels? For our audience who assume they know nothing about E-fuels. Okay. So e-fuels on one hand is 
completely comparable to fossil fuel which we get at the gas station today. Yeah. On the other hand, it's not on fossil base. It's made out of renewable energy. So it's wind or solar energy or, or water power. Right. You need hydrogen right. out of water and you need carbon dioxide. And with, with these three things, energy, hydrogen and carbon dioxide, you can make e-fuels. Okay. The production process is you take the hydrogen and the carbon dioxide and make e-methanol as a first step. So this is a first liquid energy carrier, but you cannot directly use it in the car. So you have to do a second step, which okay. is called MTG. It's methanol to gasoline, okay. which is a process. Uh, this is known for about 50 years now. Um, it was uh, invented by ExxonMobil. And uh, with this process, you're able to create a fuel, which is almost like the fuel you get at the gas station. How, uh, how similar? Like if I, I'm, a, I'm yeah. a chemist in a laboratory with a microscope, can I hydrofluorocarbon to hydrofluorocarbon? Like can I, if you do a chemical analysis, you will find lots of similar components. They are the molecules look exactly the same, uh, and there are some some other components. So it's about maybe eighty to ninety percent similar, and the rest is slightly different. And what we have to do is that we get this fuel into the fuel specification. Uh, of the, the current uh, gasoline which we can buy at the gas station so that we can use it directly in, in, in our cars. Okay, now, you, the, the, the car I drove yesterday, it, there's a spark plug, there's an explosion, and out of the tailpipe still comes carbon dioxide, so why are exactly. we bothering at all? So, the difference between the fossil fuel and what we do with the e-fuels is fossil fuel comes out of the ground and if you burn it, you produce additional carbon dioxide, which is put into the atmosphere. If you use e-fuels, we take, as I mentioned, the CO2 out of the atmosphere and make e-fuels. And if you burn it, you get the same amount of carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere. So, so there is a, a you're circular. You're recycling uh, the carbon dioxide rather than pumping out more. Exactly. So you don't you don't change the mixture exactly. of nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Yeah. You just move it around. Yeah. Is it is so it nice. truly s circular? I know circular sustainability is a big theme in the automotive yeah. industry. Is it is it really, you know, ten kilograms of CO two in ten kilograms of CO two out? Exactly. It is. Yes. Yeah. No loss. Yeah. You don't. No, uh, regarding the, the manufacturing process, there is no losses. Okay. For creating one liter of, of uh, e-fuel, the, uh, the one liter of e-fuel will emit about 2.8 kilograms of CO2 if you burn it. Okay. And if you want to produce one liter of e-fuel, you exactly have to take these 2.8 kilograms of CO2 out of the atmosphere and add the hydrogen and then you have the th this one liter of e-fuel which when you burn exactly brings that 2.8 kilograms of co2 back and okay. this is predicated upon you have to use green energy in other words if we're burning exactly. natural yeah. gas or coal to make e-fuel yeah. it's stupid what we want to do is is uh, we want to be uh, carbon neutral right and if you do it with uh, with the uh, coal power or whatever like natural gas yeah. it's not it's not uh, you you will produce additional co2 so then you don't have this this carbon neutrality and you guys are doing this with hif as your partner exactly. uh, who's a subsidiary of hif global HIF and global. Uh, the the mother company is ame it's andes mining and energy right and the 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 the, the first plant that's producing this is patagonia why are you in patagonia because <laughs> it's the end of the earth. <laughs> it's the end of the world, and it's a long trip. That's right. But uh, if you ever been there, you will recognize there is so much wind power, which is not used today by anyone. There's no population. There is 
There is very, one. Very few. By the way, there you is... guys are blowing a lot of people's minds right now who thought Patagonia was simply a brand of clothes sold at REI. No, no. It's no. like it's an actual place. It's a place. At the tip of, tip of South, South America. America. Very yeah. cold. It's very windy. <laughs> Lots of, a lot of uh, alpacas. penguin like things. Yes. Yeah. But so, so in other words, there's a lot of energy that could be produced by windmills. Exactly. But there'd be nothing to do with it. Yeah. So you have to liquefy it and take it somewhere else. Okay. Yeah. Is exactly. That fair? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So if we, if you would do it, uh, for example, in Germany, there is lots of competition for the for the, the renewable energy, because we have electromobility, we have we have uh, industry, houses and houses for uh, for for heating the houses. So we have lots of of demand for a renewable energy, and it would not be good to also produce e-fuels in Germany. If you go to Patagonia. There is no other need for this uh, energy. So today it's wasted every day and every day. And what we want to do is to produce additional renewable energy, which uh, is very cheap due to this huge amount of wind. And this helps us to decrease the production cost as well as to decrease the, the needed investment to produce the fuel because right, right. one windmill will produce much more energy than uh, if you would put it for example to, to Germany okay now where, where oh hang on you because you, you mentioned um, that there's the wind is plentiful the energy there is plentiful that takes some of the cost out yeah but where in the process is it still expensive I, I, I assume first of all are you an engineer or a chemist by by background this is, seems like a very chemical Chemi chemistry intensive for process you're, you're, you're working uh, it with. is yeah, yeah. so <laughs> i me myself i'm a mechanical engineer okay most of my 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 work life i worked on on engines okay and on engine calibration work and so on now you're like test tubes and things right this must be like this difficult <laughs> like transition for you you're like oh, uh, no because no? i uh, if you work on engines you also have to deal with with fuel okay as well okay so fuel was always there and okay. i was interested to to decarbonize or to find options to reduce the co2 footprint of of combustion engines okay and therefore it was uh it was not 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 difficult for me okay but so but in the process the mtg methanol the gas i mean surely this is this is an emerging technology, so yeah. the the cost is quite high. Where, where do efficiencies need to be made within the from the the wind that's powering the plant to the stuff mm -hmm. that comes theoretically out of the pump? So, see what what we do in in Patagonia is we have a a, a pilot plant, a demo, okay, and this is based on existing technology. We have an electrolyzer, we have uh, uh, the methanol synthesis we have the methanol to gasoline synthesis and this is all existing technology and if if you work on this technology you will have some new ideas some improvements you find maybe other solutions to to come to this uh to this gasoline okay uh, maybe with other pro uh, production processes and therefore if a lot of it's it's the same thing as as in electromobility the more people are working on it right. the more development you will right. get and the more improvements you will get and this is how the cost uh, can come down uh if it's i if i can pause you right there this okay. is a, this is a key <laughs> point because i love i love this part of the conversation johnny wants to say something but uh, this is this is where we get a lot of people who will comment this is on youtube They'll comment below, say, this sucks, I hate this, I'm all about internal combustion forever, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. But the point is, in the move towards sustainable you know, uh, vehicles, the move towards decarbonizing, I would say that internal combustion engines, we're living in this, this golden era of horsepower and efficiency. Cars have never been more powerful, faster, cleaner. more efficient, more cleaner. Yeah. But the development cycle for internal combustion has been going on for, well, in this case, 75 years for Porsche, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're just scratching the surface on some of the other solutions, including electrification, right? Mm -hmm. Like all the investments in batteries and lithium. Everyone points out, oh, lithium, and they're dirty, dirty. It's like, yes, 
Did you know we just found like one of the, the globe's like largest supplies of lithium here in the United States? Like we would not be looking for this stuff. We would not be developing yeah. these things if there wasn't such a huge push. And this is where people think like big government is bad for, for mandating some of this stuff. But it is incentives. You know, deals are cutting the Biden infrastructure reduction, you know, inflation also, reduction plan. The EU has said, hey, go be green. Right. Yeah. These uh, there's big sticks. There's big carrots. There's big sticks to get people to move in this direction. And yeah. ultimately, that's where the innovation is going to come from. Exactly. So, OK, yeah. great. So, so don't be mad. Be happy. So, you know? OK, but but so you have this. You, I know you, 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 you we spoke earlier. So you have a plant in Patagonia. And there's one going to come online in Houston, Texas. Exactly. And yeah. one in Tasmania. Yeah. Um, well, all right. I live in california and i would like some e-fuel for my car mm -hmm. how do i get it from texas like what yeah. so what's the what, what happens there how does so you could do two things one thing is if if you want to have don't, the and don't say move to texas i'm not, I'm not. <laughs> okay so it's three things okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if uh one thing is you could uh you could transport the fuel that from texas to california this causes some CO2 footprint because the truck will not be CO2 neutral today. Unless it's a battery powered truck or so, so yeah. sure. truck in some way, hydrogen, but whatever. Yeah, yeah. In in future, the truck will also decarbonize. Yes. So in in not today, but uh, in in the future, the the CO2 footprint will reduce, so that uh, there is a it's a, it, it would be a good solution to bring the fuel to California. Okay. And you can fill it directly in your car. No. The other solution would be if we put the fuel which is produced just in the refinery where the fossil fuel mm. still is, is uh, processed, then we can reduce the CO2 footprint of the refinery. And on a balance sheet uh, view, there is no difference. If you have the fuel directly in your car or... Some other cars reduce the CO2 footprint right. for you. Right. If, it's, so if, it's it's if it's mixed in the tank. It's like, right? exactly. it's like carbon yeah. credits. You get yeah. to this weird Almost. horse trading, like, yeah, you, you will yeah. lower but here. But if you buy some fuel, the oil company has to make sure that the same amount of e-fuel comes into the market. So you make sure that the CO2 footprint uh, reduces really. Right. Okay. And now, so, oh, go ahead. So, go ahead. so, you know, we're here at Rensport. You can probably hear some of the background noise. There are literally race cars of all all different stripes firing up. All we, Porsches. All Porsches. <laughs> we can smell them. We can smell the fuel uh, yeah. being burned. It's a great. Nine six two just started up and drove off. By yes, the way. Yeah. very analog. We're yeah. we're actually we should thank. We're in uh, Tag Heuer's amazing display. They loaned us all these beautiful watches to wear. Um, I'm wearing a Monaco. It's amazing. Carrera. Seventy five hundred bucks. Uh, the so the question I have is, sure. uh, first of all, this is a this is excuse my ignorance. When you talk about the you know these are all we're talking like we're passenger cars and how it might fit in this these beautiful you know nine nine you know nine nine six and ninety sevens that are surrounding us, but will this work for all uh, current fossil fuel applications? Does it work in yeah. in diesel? Can, can can is there an impact there? Can it work for jet airplanes? And cargo yeah. ships and every every place you would be burning a hydrocarbon fuel. Yeah. So yeah. as to, as as today, you have different kind of fuels. You have diesel. You have kerosene. Yep. You have gasoline. And you, if you switch to renewable uh, fuels, you have also to produce e uh e sustainable fuel, uh, aviation fuel. You have to produce diesel. You have to produce gasoline. There are different technologies to produce these fuels, okay. but it's possible to provide all the variety of fuels which we have today. And the existing engines won't know the difference. Exactly. As long so the, the main goal is that we meet the current specification of the fuel at the gas station. As long as we do that and we are in that specification, the engine will not recognize whether it's a synthetic fuel or it's a fossil fuel. You drove the 356 yesterday yes, and sir. there was no difference. It, it felt like a car to me. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a very special, different cramped car. But yeah, yeah but it was you know the first. But regarding Porsche the ever fuel, made. there is engine no, was strong. There yeah, is yeah. no difference. None, Johnny. None. Didn't you say and that you could even to to your point, you're trying to just hit this current specification, yeah, which is naturally derived again from fossil fuels. Again, pe- people might just throw out fossil fuels and not remember that it's literally old dinosaurs and, and plants. plants. <laughs> buried for hundreds of millions of years that are coming up out of the yeah. ground. Um, I think you were saying this, you can actually theoretically make it cleaner. Yeah. But That's the, the, maybe some of, this is the same problem we had. What was it? Um, when they started adding, was it ethanol to, to yeah. fuel systems? Works, combusts fine, but there are downstream implications like the hoses, you know, it's eroding different things. So you don't yeah. want to, you don't want to introduce a new well, problem, which also, is why you try to hit the spec. Yeah. Of but the, also, of the if, if it, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, the, the main thing is the engine calibration yeah. is done with a certain fuel, yeah. with certain fuel properties. And if we want to make sure that there is no modification needed to the right. engine, right. We, have to, we have to make sure that the fuel looks the same. Okay. And yeah. therefore, we try to, to, uh, to, reach, uh, to, to reach this specification. But what we could do oh, is yeah. we could create a, a new fuel. Mm-hmm. which would be better, better octane number, cleaner burning, uh, some different properties. But the problem would be that we have to modify the cars. Yeah. And if you want to, if we need to do that, this would take time. So you don't have the fuel at the fuel station. You don't have the modification at the car. And this would take as long as electromobility uh, mobility uh, takes today because only new cars come into the market and this this will take some time until there is sufficient volume in the right. market. So your point is you can decarbonize everybody now with mass adoption exactly. of, of e-fuels. And this is, from our point of view, this makes the existing carpool from problem to part of the decarbonization solution. Interesting. But Porsche said, look, going forward, uh, almost everything we build is going to be electric. 911s, they can keep a gas motor, but everything else. Meaning in the future, a future, the 999 911, 995, whatever, you could engineer it around a super fake uh, synthetic fuel that doesn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. And and it would, you know, you could run it on that. that, That's a possibility. On long term maybe it could be an option okay but uh what we are really focusing is on the existing fleet which are 1.3 or 1.4 billion of cars on this planet right and we think that we first have to solve that problem and then we can think about it's a further improvements a solution for all and i'll tell you why johnny but i want to i think i know why he's not talking about future products on this because EVs e- when you talk about electric vehicles versus the current electromechanical vehicles ones with internal combustion engines um, there's a huge advantage to EVs from a parts complexity there's you know m- battery motor you know some software code a couple of microchips I mean oversimplifying but internal combustion still requires you know piston valve valve spring yeah. like hundreds thousands of parts that you just don't have to have transitions with multiple gears exactly if while all of the other competitors to porsche and vw group in the world are moving towards evs even if you have a great synthetic fuel that still needs to be combusted you have an order of magnitude more parts and manufacturing you need to support to sustain that is that is that a fair assessment uh well, that's right. Uh, the, the the amount of parts is, is l- much lower on the EV side. Um, I think the complexity is in within the battery. Yep. But uh, before I focused on, on e-fuels, I was responsible for the, the engine pre-development at Porsche. Okay. And this is for combustion engine as well as for the EV powertrains. So I know EV powertrains as well. Okay. And we had... It's the same thing if you if you work on on EV powertrains, you get you see problems, you see options, you see ideas, 
and you make improvements. Yep. And there is still lots of improvements to do also on the EV side and oh, on the sure. EV motor side. Sure. And uh, I can tell you there is more to come from Porsche side on the EV motor side. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, look, this is great because as Johnny knows, I've always been kind of, mm, really? Synthetic fuels? E-fuels? Like, come on. But the, the argument you're making about the ability to decarbonize uh, billions of vehicles like now and not just and again it's very generous of Porsche because you're not just talking about there's not a billion Porsches out there you're talking about any yeah. internal combustion engine that is a, well, that is a they'll probably make a little money on the deal but yeah yeah really but that's a that's a big <laughs> picture it's not that generous <laughs> <laughs> that's a big, but it's still a big picture yeah, you know idea yeah. um, who else is a partner is this is this a Porsche led uh strategy is or is there others within the group and i know you do have some help with some of the the the, the fuel the oil companies so regarding uh when we when we started it was on our own nice we okay. we thought about how could we how could we uh decrease the co2 footprint of engines and we started working on on synthetic fuels and then what happened is that we uh that we needed to know who are the players in that market, mm. who are the players in that technology. So we we did uh, we got a lot of connections to companies, to startups and so on. And uh, then we, we, uh, we got some kind of a network. And uh, with, with, a, with a HIF Global company, okay. we found a partner who has the same mindset as we have. And uh, with HIF Global, we built that uh, pilot plant in Chile. Okay. And there are for sure several um, other companies that helped to make it true. So there is uh, Siemens Energy, for example, right. providing the wind turbine and the electrolyzer. There is um, ExxonMobil providing the um, methanol to gasoline process. And so there are lots of uh, some other companies, right. and with these companies together, we built that pilot plant. Right, Siemens, ExxonMobil, small companies, no one's yeah. ever heard of. But okay, so <laughs> Carl, uh, I love my GT3. That's and, great. But I've decided that I really want to power it on just synthetic fuel. When, when can I do that? So today we have the pilot plant, yeah. and HIF Global is looking for industrialization. As you already mentioned, first uh, one of the, the plants will be in the U.S., mm -hmm. in, uh, in Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, today they are doing a so-called feed study, which is uh, in the end uh, uh, they make a concept how the, the final uh, facility will look like. So it's, it's the dimensioning of, of the, all the reactors and, and all the stuff. And... Um, the final decision to start the, uh, the, the, the building of, the, of the, the facility will be made by end of 2024. And it takes oh, about wow. three years. Okay. So by end of 2027, around that, uh, the first fuel should be produced. So this is gonna be a couple of years. Will, 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 there, will I ever, as a consumer, like I wanna to go to a gas station because it sounds like you're, you'll be mixing in the Porsche e-fuel into whatever Chevron has in their pumps. And so you'll be, or, you'll be, X, or Exxon. Or yeah. Exxon. But yeah. you'll be lowering uh, the amount of new carbon release. But is there a way, will I ever get to like, I just want 100% mm -hmm. carbon capture of fuel. Is that, like, how far off is that? Pretty well, far? Well, I, I believe it, uh, the, these two options, bringing it to the refinery uh, and in, in some places, providing this special fuel for customers, I think both of, of these options will be there. Uh, regarding the CO2 footprint, as we already discussed, um, lowering the CO2 footprint by dropping it in into the fossil uh, fuel of the refinery would be the more efficient way. And therefore, I think this is the, the priority. The, the priority. Uh, but for sure, for customers like we, we, we see here, uh, there will be, I think, some, some special gas station with, uh, with e-fuels. Yeah, when did, when oh. did this program start? 
red Porsche. How long? How long is it? So you mentioned like 2025, 2027. Like we'll see some yeah. product. When? When did this? So we started. Happen? We started working on on synthetic fuels in 2016. Wow. Within okay. my department uh, of for engine pre-development, and this uh, my department was also. Um, uh, responsible or for the fluids in the car so for the for example the cooling fluid and the lubricants and also for fuel quality and since that time we are working on on synthetic fuels and now on a fluid. that seems pretty fast if you're saying by i mean just kind of based on the timeline you outlined 20 2027 or 20 between 2027 2030 we might be able to see this a yeah. consumer might be able to see this in, in a pump. Yeah, so, so 15 as I, years from... As I, as I said, it's 11, existing technology. Yeah. It's existing technology. Electrolyzer is, is a known technology. Uh -huh. uh, a wind turbine is a known technology. The, the synthesis processes, uh, making methanol or making methanol to gasoline, is all known stuff. The methanol to gasoline pro process was invented in the 1970s by Exxon Mobil, so it's about 50 years old. Okay. All right, but a little, a little devil's advocate here. So, okay, um, I'm making a bunch of synthetic fuel in Patagonia. There's no people in Patagonia. I'm not building a pipeline over the Andes. Yeah. I got to put in a big, dirty, ugly, awful boat that's burning bunker fuel. Uh, yeah. how, what? No, that's. That's got to, how do you get around that? What's the, what's the long-term solution to that? This is today. Yes. Today, the, the, the ships will run with that bad fuel. It's bad, yeah. But they also have to decarbonize. And what happens on the marine sector is uh, that uh, the ships will run with either ammonia or with methanol. And this e-methanol could also be produced in Patagonia. Because that's the first thing you produce exactly. before you turn into gasoline exactly. is methanol. Yeah. Huh. So e-methanol is, is a kind of a crude oil for the future. Are you working on these ships? Who's working on these ships? Uh, you know the Volkswagen group is very big. It's very big, is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm aware. And there is, there is one part, it's MAN Energy Solutions. Oh yeah, the big and, trucks and the boats and, they, and things. Yeah, right? they make trucks, but they also make uh, engines yep. for ships yep 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 and they already are working and also uh, and already have uh, have uh, um, uh, some customers they want to have methanol engines so they they uh, really provide some upgrade kits for for these engines in the marine sector because these engines will run for decades it's not yes. only for like a car for 10 or 20 years uh it's it's much uh, the the lifetime of such an engine is much, uh, much so longer in-house you're, you're doing in-house oil tankers exactly essentially. <laughs> and, okay, okay okay um all right awesome. uh, that, that solves that but, but how far out is that like if in other words if patagonia is making fuel that might be burned in cars by 2027 how long before the cleaner oil tanker comes along? Tanker. So as I as I mentioned, uh, MAN Energy already has some some customers, and they okay. uh, they ordered uh, this upgrade kits. So this could happen in this in almost the same time frame. Okay. Because it would be it, like, regarding like a, a, a big scale in yeah. in lots of ships, it will also take some time. Yeah. But just like optically. You know, if I'm like, yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, circular carbon fuel, I would want to feel better if it's a circular carbon capture transportation, right? I mean, yeah. that's that's the yeah. dream. That's the that's the the long term goal. Got it. But what you have to 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 keep in mind is that uh, on one liter of fuel, the amount of CO2 footprint of that transport in a big scale is not that much no it's not no okay so if you for sure if you if you go with a with a small volume uh and transport it with uh, with a with a ship or with with whatever uh it's relatively high but if you have a, a big tanker if i have 16 million liters yeah exactly <laughs> 
Okay, uh, so then, com uh, compared to, uh, to, to one unit, to one liter, uh, the fuel consumption of the ship is not that much. Right. And therefore, mm -hmm. the, food pr uh, the CO2 footprint is not that okay. high. Okay, so okay. it's a net, still a net benefit, yeah. even though it's not ideal. Yeah. So, for sure. And we have, we have to keep in mind, what we are looking for is to be ca completely carbon neutral in 2050. So, in, if we would, in 2030... We would have a, a CO2 reduction of 50 or 60 percent. This still there, yeah. would be a very, very good uh, approach yep. uh, helping the climate. Okay. So we're going to have to close it up here in a little bit. But I want to see some questions about about this event. And we're here at Rensport. And our, our pal over there, um, Calvin, was showing us some e-fuel stickers. You have a number of cars here that are running on e-fuels, right? It's the, it's the number, the first Porsche. Uh, first Porsche. First Porsche ever made that Johnny got <laughs> exactly, to drive. Yeah. yeah. Um, what else is running here at Rensport on e-fuels? Uh, we have the, 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 the VIP shuttles running with e-fuels. Okay, VIP shuttles, yes. Yeah. And those are what cars? Those are all um, um, Panameras? I it, was in a Cayenne yesterday. It uh, should be, I think it's Cayenne. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, we, qui we I'm not quite sure or, or, or what... Or, kind of cars are here it should be panamera or, or okay and then any other vehicles the things on track that are running anything uh the 919 will run and there will will uh, will be done some some show uh drives okay with uh, uh with the cars and i honestly i don't know exactly which car uh okay. is uh, is running uh exactly but we have about 2,500 liters of fuel here to demonstrate that these cars uh, are working fine with okay. e-fuels. Now, for those of us who are watching on YouTube, are there any cool videos, any any interesting explainers they could look up if they're curious about what you guys are doing, what Porsche is doing with e-fuels? So one thing could be the uh, the homepage of HIF Global. Okay. There is lots of explanation there. You can see the, the, the pilot plant. They can see you can see the the location. You can see the production uh, processes. And this could be interesting okay. uh, to get more information. And I'm sure there's a plan at some level where maybe e-fuels roll out to like uh, your experience centers globally. Maybe you could have like little. This is also what we are trying to do. Yeah, uh, to if the if the the scale up uh, will work, we are trying to um, provide fuel for our uh, experience centers as well. Okay. All right, now hang on. Before he goes, weren't you involved with the development of some car called the Carrera GT? Yes, <laughs> I was. Can, can you talk to us just... But this was, th just this was not in my time at Porsche. Uh, oh, uh, no? No. <laughs> as, I, as I mentioned, I, was, uh, I, I joined the company in 2008. Yeah. And the production of the Car Carrera GT was in 2003 to... Yeah, to so how were you? Because I, I heard you were involved. What, what, who were you? What, what was your involvement? Yeah, so uh, f before I worked for Porsche, I worked for a, a big supplier... Uh, of electronic parts is it, is it, in it, Germany. Is it near Zuffenhausen? It's near Zuffenhausen. I've, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> does, it it it, 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 does it start with a B? Does it start with a B? <laughs> it starts R with a B, B and yeah, 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 uh, yeah, ends yeah. with an Osh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, and I was responsible for the uh, the engine calibration and the ECU Got of it. the Carrera GT. Okay, so I was involved in that uh, that's project. That's a pretty fun project. And <laughs> this was really fun, yes. <laughs> well, speaking of fun, you're here at Rensport. You've been a, you're a veteran of, of Porsche. Your father worked for Porsche. What person or what vehicle, what are you most excited about seeing here? Uh, and what car should Johnny and I go check out? Is yeah. there anything here that you're just like, oh, man, this is a very unique uh, you know, opportunity? That's difficult to say because there are lots of, of, of nice and uh, well, pretty cars. Of, of the uh, uh, priceless cars you can see right now. No. <laughs> so my, my personal favorite yes. is the 964. Okay. Okay. Because uh, when, I, when I did my studies, I had some, some time in Weissach uh, in 1986. And... There, at that time, I had the chance to work uh, with the engineers. Okay. 
Okay. And uh, this was for the 964 engine. And so there is a, new, a, a little was, relationship was the, to that engine. That was the brand new Porsche 911. In, in, uh, exactly. That was the first new 911 yeah. in 20 years, in, yeah. in, in 86. So. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's All cool. right. So, so we'll this, this is why I'm, I have a, a special relationship to that uh to that car but any any 964 in particular like rs america not really okay <laughs> loves them all I, we're getting the high all. sign we yeah. gotta but go I'm, so but I, what i like oh. is natural aspirated engines uh with uh nice sound and high refs <laughs> all right <laughs> awesome don't awesome. we all and on that note uh we got to wrap this episode of the inevitable up Thank you so much. Carl, thank you so, so much. Thank you for it was your a time. Real pleasure. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate the education. Thank uh, you E-fuels. for the po- uh, possibility. Yes, this is amazing. Also, thank you to our friends uh, at Tag Heuer for allowing us to shoot here and keeping these wonderful watches, keeping taking home with us <laughs> right yeah, it's now. A really nice parting gift. One, yeah. two, three. Let's all run in three directions uh, before they take these wonderful watches back. No, but thank you so much. This was awesome. And I uh, hope to see you sometime soon on The Inevitable. Thank you. Thank you very much.